Everybody, welcome to Good Villa. Let's start that again. Start it over. Let's start that again. Yeah. We? Welcome to Not Just Blown Smoke. That was Jeff Pitchell's Fat Cigar you were just listening to. And we're very glad to be able to play that to intro our show. Uh, yep. We're coming at you live from Twin Smoke Shop Studio Headquarters in Hooks at New Hampshire. Please make sure that you follow us on uh, Podbean, Spotify, iTunes, Google, wherever you get your podcast from. I'm Pastor Padron. I'm here with my co-hosts, Paul, Nick, and Dave. And um, we have Mark Mormar joining us from South Carolina. Hello, hello. Hi there, Mark. How you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you boys? We're doing very well. And uh, thank you for asking. And we were going to have uh, Lauren Ferraro, Miss Ashton, with us tonight. And um, uh, we're smoking one of... Uh, the cigars that she represents, the San Cristobal Revelation legend. But uh, Lauren was not able to make it tonight. Uh, but we know many of you listeners and watchers out there, especially the watchers, were really hoping to see Lauren tonight, uh, especially since she's, you know, the number one watched video that we have. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for... Uh, you know, Lauren, we wanted to wish her a speedy recovery from whatever she's sick with. So we put together a little something so that everybody could see Lauren. Dave? Yes, it is coming. <laughs> So that's about all we're going to see of Lauren tonight. Uh, I didn't get to see it. You didn't get to see it, Mark? Should have had it on your phone, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> when this You'll is be over, able to see can... it. Yeah, when this now, is over, Dave, you can replay I didn't, it. I didn't hear the, the music I had strung with that. Did the music play during that, do you know? Yes, it looked like it was. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see what happens with that. But regardless, look, the show must go on, even if Lauren is not here. So let me tell you a little bit about the San Cristobal Revelation legend by Ashton Cigars. And from their website, they describe the Revelation series like this. A milk chocolate hued Ecuador Sumatra wrapper is perfectly matured and drawn over a stunning core of Nicaraguan binder and filler tobaccos in San Cristobal Revelation. A handful of big ring gauge shapes join the soft box press series in a versatile and luscious profile of cinnamon, almonds, sweetened coffee beans, and peppery caramels. The succulent medium bodied blend demonstrates an incredible mix of woody and creamy tasting notes with a tender aroma 
subtlety and strength exist side by side. Mm. <clears throat> There's a lot of adjectives in their descriptions. Yeah, they're very good at that. They are. Yes. <laughs> they yeah. do like their descriptive terms. We'll shout see. Out to, uh, shout out to the Ashton marketing team for uh, squeezing in succulent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tender aroma. Tender <laughs> aroma. So tender. It's so tender. It's so tender. Oh, don't touch it. It's tender. Too tender. Too tender to touch. Too tender to touch. Mm. That should wow. be a song. It probably is. Somewhere. But it should be. You're right. So Ecuadorian Sumatra <laughs> rapper, Nicaraguan binder filler. It's a softbox press Toro uh, that is six and a quarter by 52 on the ring gauge. And... Um, where, of course, as you probably noticed by what you see and by the introductions that we are sans anyone from the 724 Lounge tonight, um, which sucks, but we have Paul. We Paul. do. <laughs> the Pablo what? Maduro what? returns. What? <laughs> Boy, you know you're in trouble if that's all you have to say. We have me. <laughs> but we have Paul. Paul, what did uh, what did you bring to drink tonight? <laughs> so, so, right. so since we have no representation from the 724 Lounge, <laughs> uh, what was I, that? I did I did I did spend a little bit of time today with Kendra upstairs. I, I had an idea of what I wanted to pair the cigar and pipe tobacco with. Um, I'm a big fan of the Glenfiddich 15 years. Um, it's got the sherry cask, um, wonderful, you know, full body flavors with that. But she kind of steered me in a slightly different direction. Um, and tonight we are drinking the Glenfiddich 14 years. Ooh. Took you down a year, huh? Yeah, just took me down a year. Um, so this is straight from the Glenfiddich website. Think a bourbon heart can't hold a single malt soul? Our 14-year-old bourbon barrel reserve delivers the smooth sophistication of Scotland with a sweet kick of Kentucky. Ooh. <laughs> our, daddy like. Our malt master waits 14 years as the whiskey matures in ex-bourbon American oak casks. He then finishes the whiskey in charred new American oak barrels supplied by the Kelvin Cooperative. Co <laughs> Cooperage in Louisville, Kentucky. The result is a rich, sweet, and vibrant single malt that delivers complex flavors of woody spices with ripe summer fruit. It's an expression that will inspire scotch and bourbon lovers alike to rethink whiskey. Mm. I agree with that. Yeah. So on the nose, you'll get deep, vibrant vanilla notes with hints of citrus, caramelized brown sugar, and cinnamon. Mm, the okay. taste, taste should be... Beautifully rich and sweet with layers of creamy toffee, woody spices, candied orange peel, and fresh toasted oak. Candied orange peel. Ooh. That sounds, uh, that reminds me of something I read in this description here. Um, sweetened coffee beans. Ooh. Sweetened so, coffee beans. Candied, candied orange, orange peels. Hmm. Candied orange peels. Look at that. Candied orange peel. I like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What's a sweetened coffee bean? I don't well, know. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Chocolate like covered what, coffee what, bean? What is a sweetened coffee bean? Um, it really sounds good when you say it, but what is it really? I don't know. I don't know. I, I would always, I would, if by saying that, I would think. It would be like a chocolate covered coffee bean or something like that, or so espresso it's, bean. It's like an acid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> an acid coffee bean. Maybe. Uh, the back. Uh, what are we thinking of the pairing so far, um, Dave? Um, <laughs> thanks, Dan. Oh, so wait a Lauren, minute. Wait what a minute. nice look that was. How about we all say hi to Lauren? Yep, because she's watching, watching right tonight. now. That's what Dave was trying to to point out. So yep. hi, Lauren. How are you? We miss you. You should be sitting here drinking some Glenfiddich with us, but you're not. It's I'm okay. glad she's watching now. Absolutely. We'll see you Friday. So Dave. Yes, Dan. What do you think of the pairing? I think it's good. 
All right, Nick. <laughs> I also think it's very good. Very good. Oh. Okay. So <laughs> the cigar on its own, I'm picking up a lot of uh, earthy leather cedar notes. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very uh, well balanced. Not one note is, is overpowering the other. You know, very, very smooth. The drink, I think, is taking away a little bit of the cedar notes and bring out a little bit more of the earth and leather. Mm. Um, I think because of the uh, orange that I'm getting, the orange flavors that I'm getting from the uh, Glenfiddich, it is maybe taking a little bit away uh, of the sweet notes from the cigar, but it is enhancing more of the uh, earthy leather notes for me. Yeah, I definitely agree with the earthy, leathery uh, wood notes on the cigar. Um, I think the pairing is going very well. Yeah. I, I do think there's a lot of citrusy, you know, orange citrusy kind of finish on the um, whiskey. Yep. And that's definitely affecting uh, um, my taste of the cigar. Correct. Um, I'm not sure what it's up playing or down playing yet, but it does pair well with it. I do, I do like how it's playing with the cigar. No, we did this blindly. This mm -hmm. is this is just something that Kendra thought because I was thinking Glenfiddich, mm -hmm. and because I like the fifteen year, you know, because just because it's it's aged in sherry uh, casks, mm -hmm. um, that this would because we all love bourbon, right? That this one might pair a little bit better, but she hasn't smoked the Legend, she hasn't smoked the Jupiter, so we we're just kind of sh uh, shot in the dark. And uh, so I think so far it's 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 holding up pretty well. Yeah, I definitely agree. Mm. The, the scotch is smooth and light, mm. but the finish is bold. Mm. Like you're right up front, you know it's scotch, but then right at the right at the finish, right at the end, it's bold like bourbon, but it's not heavy, and you still get some nice sweet flavors in there. A little little zing at the end. I think you just described Mark Mormar. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Smooth up front, but zingy on the back end. Oh, jeepers. But it's really good. It's really good. <laughs> it's, going, it's going really, really, really good. So, but for me, the, the Glenfiddich is... Uh, the zing, to me, kind of, kind of comes in the middle, and the sweetness is what lingers for me. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So yeah. it, it's very smooth, just a tad bit of spice, uh, mm -hmm. maybe a second or two after I, you know, take take the drink. Mm -hmm. But then the the sweetness lingers much longer. And for me, the cigar is the opposite of that. You get the sweetness up front, and it's nice and light and smooth on the finish. Mm. And there's a, uh, and again, to me, this is a, a Ashton yeah. thing. There is a smooth creaminess to this cigar. All the way yeah, through. All absolutely. their cigars yep. have this really creamy, smooth aspect to the finish. And uh, the San Cristobal Revelation legend is no exception to that. Yep. Um, very, very nice. Um, medium bodied? Yes. Oh, yeah. Medium bodied, certainly not anything more than that. Right. Maybe even a, not like a light medium, but on the lighter range of medium yeah. to me. Medium minus. Medium minus. I, there you go. Yeah, Thank there you, you go. Mark. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. You look so great laid back there on your couch. Dude, what do you think of the cigar? I, I like it. I like the whole <laughs> Oh, so you're taking after Dave now. Okay. <laughs> the uh yeah, I like the whole I like the whole San Cristobal line, really. Um I like what they do with their, their wrappers in particular. Don't even though they might look like they're going to add um, a lot of flavor on the tongue, you know, right away, which sometimes can distract from, especially on a, a slightly, you know, milder, medium minus cigar. Um, I just find it really well balanced. Unfortunately, I'm not pairing with with your scotch, but um, so I'm getting a chance to just enjoy the cigar on its own, and it's delightful. Weird, you're uh, drinking. You're drinking uh, coffee, correct? I'm drinking coffee, yes. Yeah, the coffee would go great. Yeah, I'm going to pull out different things yeah. than you guys are. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, the, the San Cristobal was blended, you know, for Ashton by uh, Don Pepin Garcia. 
and it's manufactured in the My Father factory in uh, Nicaragua for them. Um, I, back around, what was it? I want to say 2000 or something, uh, the Garcias and the Levins of Ashton met, and this kind of ended up coming out of their friendship, wanting to do something together, nice. some kind of collaboration. And uh, since then, it's been a huge success for them. And um, the uh, construction on this, too, has been really, really nice. Oh, yeah. Straight, straight. This is one of the straightest burn lines I've had on, in recent weeks on my cigar here on the show. Looking around at everybody, it looks like almost everybody's having the same experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, the construction is just very on point. Um, Paul, we're doing a lot of uh, specials with Ashton this month. We are. At Twins. You want to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on that way? So, since <clears throat> Lauren isn't here. Well, hopefully, Lauren, you will uh, <laughs> be here Friday. I'm, I'm sure you will. Um, but on Friday, between the hours of 3 to 8, um, we will be having the Ashton Grand Prize Finale event. Finale. Finale. Prize now, we've finale. had... What three different events already with them? Yeah, this yes. would be the fourth. This will be the fourth. Um, and so on Friday, um, all of the Ashton line, the original ESG, VSG, San Cristobal, La Roma de Cuba, um, will be available for customers to come in. And uh, every box purchase, you'll get an additional 10% off. An additional 10%. For a total of 20% savings. That is fan frickin' tastic. With that box purchase, you will be entered for the grand prize, which will be announced later when that will happen. But we'll pull the winner that evening, and the winner will uh, have a weekend down in Philadelphia, uh, round trip airfare for two, um, hotel accommodations in Center City for two nights. A two hundred and fifty dollar gift certificate to the Ashton Cigar Lounge. That's amazing. That's great. Plus, they'll have a two hundred fifty dollar gift certificate for the Seven Star Restaurant. Whoa! Nice. The total value of that prize is worth over twenty five hundred dollars. Twenty five hundred dollars. Right. So, in order to enter into that, you have to buy a box of any Ashton product that we have. Um, you'll get the additional 10% off. There'll be some other swag that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure free cigars and maybe a lighter and a hat. Um, but you'll also get the entry for that grand prize, and then we'll pull the winner that evening. That's fantastic. Those are great deals. And, you know, for the last three months, we've highlighted specific Ashton lines, uh, starting with Ashton and then doing the La Roma de Cuba Last month was uh, San Cristobal, and now on this Friday, every line is going to be available with that extra 10% off. Um, at Twins, we um, every day discount uh, 20 count boxes at 10% off across mm -hmm. the line. Correct. And so you're already getting a great deal on their product with us, and then uh, as a way to help us through this difficult time we're dealing with, and there's a global pandemic, uh, we have arranged with them to give another 10%. And so that's going to be fantastic. 3 to 8 p.m. again? 3 to 8. 3 that's to 8 p.m. this Friday, the 28th, at Londonderry. And uh, we'll be doing the same thing here in Hooks It too. But Lauren uh, can only be in one place at once. Unless, of course, we have Dave over here and we Skype her in. Could do that. Could, could do that. Could could do that. Oh, we could put Dave in, a, just in a blonde wig. We have the technology. Maybe we can get a large cardboard cutout. <laughs> <laughs> we can raffle that off. I'm pretty sure it'll go well. Yeah, you can. You, you got to work with what you got, right? Nick? Absolutely. You got to work with what you got. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, Ashton, you know, makes a lot of different cigars, even in the San Cristobal uh, line. There's a bunch of lines in that series. Um, I'd like to know, you know, what your favorite Ashton cigar is. Do you have a favorite from their line? The VSG. The VSG. VSG. The VSG. 
Any particular one, or does it matter? VSG is. is I've is, had uh, I've had several different sizes: the robusto, I've had the spellbound, mm -hmm. uh, the bellicoso. Um, it really doesn't matter. Um, I think they're all really, really good. Um, I love the the cedar coffee uh, espresso notes that we get from that. That's really why it's my favorite from their line. Mm. Uh, Nick, what about you? Do you have a favorite uh, from Ashton? I do. And it's the ESG. The ESG. The yeah. ESG. Ooh. Um, I'm not surprised. High end. It is high end. It's high end. It's very it's high smooth end. and creamy, just like me. That's why I like it. Absolutely. I smoke it. I like nice drinking when I smoke it. Nice and tan. Tan. It's a good, it's a good wrapper. Dark and tan. Dark and tan. <laughs> it's actually a good beer. It's actually a good beer. I do appreciate those beers. Those actually the well. Well, it's a black and tan. Black and right? tan. Black and really, tan. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, the ESG does it for me every time. It's, a, it's the top-notch cigar. It's something that I indulge in probably at least once a month because mm -hmm. it is a pretty expensive cigar. It ranges anywhere from 19 to $22. Yep. Uh, it goes from the 20-year to the 24-year, I believe, mm. that we carry in those four sizes. But any of the four sizes that you can grab, um, I definitely high re highly recommend it. It's an unbelievable cigar. They use the same wrapper as the Opus X, I believe. Um, and it's amazing. It's a great cigar. I love it. Smoke it if you get it. Dave, do you have a favorite uh, Ashton brand cigar? Um, my favorite is La Roma de Cuba's Robusto. Yeah, you buy boxes. Yeah, that's I buy enough. boxes every time. Lauren knows. Yep. 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 That you have with your Sam Adams. Yeah, I, you know, I, I swear to God. And <laughs> of course, you know, I'm going to get a lot for this, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, I swear to God that the retro hail tastes like a Boston lager from Sam Adams. <laughs> and I love that cigar, and I will smoke it until I die. Well, to each his own, I suppose, right, boys? To each his own. So you're the customer that is constantly mm. prodding us to keep getting those boxes brought in. Yeah, you keep saying I got a customer that wants to buy a box of La Roma de Cuba Robustos, and it's really been you. <laughs> <laughs> just smoking them all. Out. Yeah. That's it. Busted. There you go. <laughs> After he closes down, he's smoking like three and having like three or four Boston lagers. Uh, let's. See. Uh, we've got wow. some comments going on here that are really interesting. Dave in a bikini. Dave in I a like bikini it. to really sell it. <laughs> Sell what? That's, People you know, will be running we away. We have Lauren here. He's suggesting that Dave come to work in a bikini on Friday uh, since Lauren is going to be in Londonderry. That would be a sight uh, to see right there, man. That, that oh, is, Jesus. That is, that is a poor imitation of uh, oh, Lauren. Oh, God. Yeah, that's... That would be a horrifying sight, We'd probably, to say the least. Yeah, we'd probably see the end of our growth spurt here. Say we're trying to get yeah. to is not, you know, less... Yeah. Um, I, you know, my my favorite um, Ashton it, it does with Paul also happen to be the VSG. Um, I I really enjoy that cigar. That you know that sun grown wrapper is just so very nice. Correct. And, uh, those coffee notes, the leather, the wood you get off of that. It's so smooth, and, and it still has that creamy aspect to it that mm -hmm. is just anything Ashton has. And uh, I, I really love and, and just about anything from the VSG line. I don't really yeah, have a favorite size. It's a great smoke. Um, although, truth be told, I, I'll confess something here. This oh. is not Pastor. This is like a free... Free confession. Bad, free confession. Free oh, confession. Is, free confession. I have never had an ESV. ESG. You mean ESG? ESG. Yes. ESG. You've never had one? I've never had an ESG. Oh, boy. We're going to have to change that, brother. Yep. So mm -hmm. I can't, you know, maybe if I had one of those, my whole world would change. But I have as yacht. Uh, as yacht. I, <laughs> I was going to be like, is that a I kind of word is that? I have as yet had. <laughs> Highest end Ashton. You gotta have one. I think they're they're so good. Mm. It's it's hard to just smoke one. For me, I I'm a little on the cheaper end, but when I do have <laughs> myself a, an ESG, it is a Cheap. fantastic. ESG, yes, Lord, yes, it's I, ESG. I jump around. I do all the yeah. VSG. I do the classics. 
Um, lately, I've been smoking a lot of the aged Maduros. Mm. The aged Maduros are actually pretty damn good. Just smooth, creamy, nice chocolate note in there. Mm -hmm. It's hard to put down. The Cabinet Series is probably my second favorite. Uh, yeah, that's Ashton. up there. Uh, yeah, and, Cabinet And that's something too. that I would smoke in the morning because I like to smoke more of a Connecticut or something mild mm -hmm. to medium in the morning. Yeah. Um, but that would be my second favorite mm. uh, of the line. Mark, do you have a favorite Ashton cigar? Yeah, I do. I like, I'm, I'm very fond of, well, I like these. I like the aroma, the Cubas as well, but my favorite are the VSGs. Yes. For sure. And uh, the, um, they're, they're pyramid size. I think they've got a pyramid, pyramid size, yep. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I happen to like that shape anyway. Um not surprised. But um, <laughs> but that one in particular, I think, is really nice. And but you know, not every not every line does you know a, a, a good torpedo or a good robusto. You know, as we have our our favorite uh, uh, vitolas. Um, right. But it doesn't always work like that. I mean, there's some cigars where I like you know the double Coronas got mm -hmm. you know the, the most flavor to it. Yeah, if you had a, a a preferred vitola, what would it be? Me? Yeah. Um, it would be probably there's one that's essentially like double pyramid. If I remember it's uh, it's not the Maravilla. Um, you don't see it often. Uh, what is it? Or maybe it is a Maravilla. Um, it's a long, it's a long torpedo basically mm -hmm. with another half to three quarters uh, of an inch to it. Um, in fact, one of the, the, the best cigars I think I ever smoked was, is the Cuban version of the San Cristobal, mm -hmm. um, El Moro, which is that size. Mm -hmm. I gotta look it up cause I don't think it's Maravilla. I can't remember the name of the Vitola now, but okay. that would be my, my favorite. I like a big, I like a large smoke, but I really <laughs> like that. Uh, it, it just, it fits well on the mouth, you know, and you cut that tip and when it tapers down. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing I can say here that's not going to make sense. You're, you're just, just, you're just giving tip. Nick fodder, dude. You get that good mouth feel when you get that tip in your mouth. You know it's, it. It's perfect. <laughs> It's the perfect sensation. It's wonderful. So let's get to the legit uh, Pastor Padron cigar confession for tonight's episode here. And um, what I want to talk about tonight is uh, something that, that happened in the humidor um, last week. Uh, you know, I had some guys, you know, come in there and... Um, you know, they're just, you know, browsing around. They're not doing anything, you know, wrong or nasty or anything like that. All of a sudden, one of them sneezes. Whoa. And really loud. And I turn and look, and the guy is sneezing into his hands. Yes. <laughs> Natural. <laughs> and Natural. Pastor Padron gave a very, you know, puritanical, Ooh. disapproving look. <laughs> <laughs> to the customer and i'm like you better not be touching anything else <laughs> oh, now boy. that your hands mm -hmm. have been in Defunctified. front of your you know have been working like some kleenex there mm. and you know that kind of lead is a good lead into the thing i want to talk about and that is that that one of one of my pet peeves with people in the shop is that people who get too handy or handsy with the cigars, you know, mm -hmm. as you know, I, and this is, this is something that I think is more important being that we're in this global pandemic. And I don't care where you stand on this thing, whether you're, you know, one end of the spectrum, like everybody should be wearing masks and hazmat suits all the time, or, you know, this is a whole government conspiracy and why can't we just go in there and do what we normally do? If you are going to be handling cigars that are going to eventually be put into somebody else's mouth, your hands better be clean 
when you're going in there and picking everything up. And especially now, when we have to be so concerned, you better be sure that your hands are clean. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, when people are, you know, in the humidor, you know, look for what you want. And, but if you're like picking up and taking and sniffing and rolling and then putting a cigar back in there over and over and over again, somebody else is going to pick that up. You don't know who else has touched that thing. Right. You you know what I mean? And so I think we need to be, you know, really careful that, you know, we're not overdoing it. And, and so that, that's like my pet peeve. That's, that's my confession that, that really, that really skeeved me out. And that's going to lead into this question and everybody can answer this. Mark can answer this. Um, Maybe even Lauren, if she's still there, if she could answer it, maybe she's, what is one of the grossest things you've ever seen happen in the human war? Has, Has anything like that ever happened to you? And what have you done about it? I mean, the guy, this guy was, was good. He didn't touch anything else. Did you, you give know, him was, like a whole bottle of uh, hand sanitizer? Oh to, yeah, I, I handed him. Be like, hand sanitizer. go wash your hands, like, then the hand sanitizer. He was very good. We didn't have any problems. Locked up to him was... with a bottle of Lysol. <laughs> we didn't have any problems. I would have gave but him. But it was a just like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't even believe, you know. Yeah. No, you know, right. Right. So it's when they jam the foot of the cigar right up their nostrils. Yeah, that bothers me too. That to me, that's there's no call for that at all. And even and in today's world, because of all that's been going on, that's when we shut them down. You know, literally, yeah. we say, look, you know, we just say, please don't don't touch a cigar that you really have no intention of buying. Right. Uh, but when you see someone who will unwrap it. Put it up to their nose and like just yeah yeah like they're Shove inserting a there. Q-tip to clean their nostrils. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, that's bad. It's, and then they put and then they put it down. Just can't do yeah. that. They're not just buying it. They just want to smell it and then yeah. So to me, that's yeah. that's the grossest. Yeah, and that and experience. that that you know that bugs me. That bugs it does. Me. That 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 you you know. If you... <laughs> Mark, is that your dog with the chew toy? Mark, Mark, that's fine. You don't have to stop it. Oh my gosh! Yeah, so I can't help it. This this reminds me of an episode of what we do in the shadows. And what we do in the what shadows. What we do in the are shadows. We, are we an assassin this creed is, now? Or what we do in the <laughs> shadows is a show right now on FX that's based off of a, a a movie of the same name, and it's about it's a comedy documentary. Whoa! About a coven of vampires that live on Staten Island. And on one of the episodes, they get into the vampires get into a fight with a local werewolf. Um, and the way they decide to settle their differences is to classic. is to um, pick a champion from each side who will fight on neutral ground. And the winner, will, you know, basically decide for everybody whose side was in the right. Ah. Okay. And so the the werewolf pack picks their biggest, scariest werewolf. He's like eight feet tall and everything. And he's he totally even declines to use any weapons. He just can't bite the, the werewolf to de- the the vampire to death. And the vampire, he's like trying to choose weapons. Should I pick the scimitar or the knife? Oh, I will use this. And he picks up this squeaky dog bone toy. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the werewolves all of a sudden get this worried look on their face. And he throws it over the ledge of the building. Nice. And the werewolf jumps off the building after the thing and falls 18 stories down to his death. Nice. <laughs> And now when I hear the dog thing, that's all I think of is that song. And that's Which movies I was crying. With I was crying <laughs> laughing when I saw that the first time. That was so good. Oh, yes. That's that movies with so Dan. Good. Um, Nick, have you experienced, you know, the too hands-on, too touchy-feely thing? Uh, has, yeah. Has that line I've been had... crossed for you? Or do you even have that line? Do you just... 
just let them go. Okay. Just let it go. No, I, I do have that line. Mm-hmm. It's the the people that that mm-hmm. not the foot, but they'll get like all the unwrapped cigars and they'll like put their nose to it and yeah. and like smell the cigar and it's oh, like, yeah. come on, man. We're in the middle of a pandemic here and bad enough they're touching it and then they gotta put their nose up to it. I've had to say a couple couple of lines to some people that came into the walk in and be like, Hey, you can't do that. You know what I mean? This isn't, you know, last year, this isn't, you know, you know, without the COVID and everything, Mm -hmm. you just can't do that. And I just reinforce, um, the, the, the policy of, you know, if you're going to, that we adopted in COVID a couple months ago that, you know, if you're going to buy it, then okay, then you can pick it up and you can smell it and you can put it in your tray and you can bring it up to the register and we'll check you out. But it, it you can't be doing that, especially nowadays. You just it, it can't be tolerated, unfortunately. You know, well, fortunately, it can't be. Mm. What so. was what was seeing now, and this is I've seen it in a couple of lines that have come into the humidor yeah. uh, the last couple of weeks is yeah. uh, the cigar lines that were normally unsellowed yeah. are now coming in sellowed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that was d- due to the fact of what's happening right now in this world, that they want to make sure that their cigars are protected as much as possible. Mm-hmm. They understand that people are going to pick it up. You know, unfortunately people will miss, you know, manhandle them, mishandle them, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Placencia is starting yeah, to the yellow sell out. Yeah. 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 Well, both that and the Fuegos, uh, the super flies, came in celloed now so yep. and i think you'll start to see a little bit more of some cigars that may have been unsettled in the past they may be rethinking their strategy yeah. and yeah and uh, not for nothing but the cellophane cigars get damaged a whole lot less yeah okay. yep. that's that it's a whole lot nicer for us too absolutely mm-hmm. you know but you know yep. and again you know when for the person who picks up the cigar and puts it into their nose or rubs it you know <laughs> you don't know who's done that before you exactly and, you know, light uh, bulb. Yeah. So it is not a good thing to do. Dave, have you ever seen anything like that? Or are you, I've you seen, know, oblivious? I've seen, I've seen gross stuff. You know, You've with, seen gross stuff? Um, like, what have you seen, Dave? <laughs> and, you know, stuff. Like, someone's looking at a cigar. I don't cigar think we got to ask him. And, and um, you know, he's looking at a cigar and then he sneezes into the cigar. Really? And then, sneezes and then, into and, the cigar? And Well, he's holding it, and so he covers his mouth with his hand, but he's holding his cigar with the hand that he's covering his mouth with. Did you tell him that it's and, his now? And, you're like, uh, you're buying and that then now. He just, like, <laughs> he just like looked up and looked at me, and then like slowly bro- uh-huh. <laughs> he pulled his, pulled his hands away, and there's like this little string of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you serious, Dave? Oh, like, oh, you didn't escort like, him off the property at that point? Like, I would have. Like, that cigar is yours, sir. I would have called the CDC. <laughs> really? And then I handed him a napkin, Lysol, and all that stuff. And, I, know, would, I would have called the FBI. Yes, I would have been did like, buy look, it. you got to come get this guy. And I guy. did not touch it. <laughs> I'm like, read me the number, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you can scan that yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, Lauren is piping in. Uh, she agrees with us. She'd say when somebody picks up the cigars, smells them, and then puts it back. Yep. That's um, – so we're all we're all in agreement. So, you know, when you're in a cigar store, you 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 know, um, be considerate of the people who are in there. Be considerate of the people who are coming after you, and be wary of the people who have come before you. Mm-hmm. And be you know, we're not saying don't you know touch a cigar, or handle it or anything, but really you know, uh, be very be very specific and and and. Uh, use some discretion when you're doing it. When you, if you're going to touch a cigar, you know, more than just kind of pick it up, move it over to get another one. You mm-hmm. know, make sure that th- this is a cigar you're probably going to buy, instead of you know taking it out and putting it up your nose or whatever you're going to do. <laughs> Put it up the nose after you buy it. Yes, you yeah. can do whatever you want after you buy it. Yes. Yeah, all that, all that fine stuff. All right, uh, so there we go. What's what's our final verdict here on the San Cristobal, San Cristobal? revelation, the San Cristobal? Nick, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah, this has always been since it came out um, five years ago, I believe, about five six years ago. The revelation. It's been one of my favorite cigars of San Cristobal line. Seven years. 
2013. Oh, okay. All right. Seven years ago. Yeah. I was close. a couple of years You're off. You're close. A couple close, years close, off. Close. close. Um, since this came out, it was one of my favorite ones. Um, in the line, the Revelation line, it's actually the 660 that I really like. That's the Leviathan, correct? Yes. Uh, that one is really, really great, too. That's David's favorite. He likes those big ring gauges. It's the one. the mouth feel <laughs> that he gets from the big ring gauges <laughs> is Fox is, is fantastic. Fake news. When he, yeah. when he, when he puts it up to his likes lips, big and thick. he likes them big. When big he puts it up to his lips, it's uh, mesmerizing. That's he, what she he's, said. He's told he's told me, but uh, with the scotch that Paul awesomely chose out, it's the sweetness, the earthy. The bourbon, the barrel, the wood, everything. Oh, the bourbon, it's the barrel, the wood. The bourbon, everything. <laughs> the just, paper, the cellophane, the label. It's, just, it's all just fantastic. It's, it's amazing. Carrot, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> Seamless. <laughs> Seamless. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, oh, man. I forgot oh, to ask Mark if he's seen anything gross. But maybe maybe we should save that for the right. piping section. Okay. That could be a good thing. Uh -oh. in the piping section. Yeah, we can save right. the dogs. The dogs uh, He's in the something. Something nasty. He's in the something. He found a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, what do you think of the uh, cigar? Final thoughts? Uh, the earthen leather is nice. The retro hail is uh, amazing. It's still you know like most ashes, cream and smooth. Um, the the pairing I believe is really bringing out. Um, a lot more of the earth than usual, I would think. And you would uh, think. yeah, I would think. <laughs> and uh, I'm enjoying it very much. So thank I you. I would think. I, I would, would think. think you are. Mm. Anything. Anybody would. Paul, think. does Pablo Maduro have anything to say about this non-Maduro cigar that's positive? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, the con the construction has been spot on. Mm. Uh, that's been a very even burn line. Um, haven't had to relight it. Uh, it draws very, very easily. Uh, the pairing is, uh, I think, has been really good. Uh, it's bringing out, again, a little bit more of those earthy leather wood notes more than anything else. The, the cedar notes that I was getting on its own have subsided. Uh, but the drink, I think, is uh, really, really, uh, it's a very complimentary pairing. I think it's, it's excellent. I really enjoy this cigar very much. It's just got this little bit of peppery zing on the finish. The retro hail, I agree with Dave, is uh, really, really nice, and I, I can't get over. Um, no matter what tobacco they use, you know, or what factory it's made, that quintessential Ashton creamy smoothness is in everything that they do. Um, oh, yeah. I really enjoy that cigar, and um, I really, I really feel bad that Lauren wasn't able to actually be with us i'm glad she's listening and watching um but uh i'm looking forward to uh being able to have her on in a few weeks down the road we've already worked on a a date uh for her to be back on the show kind of the makeup episode oh, yeah <laughs> you don't mean the episode's going to be about makeup though, Dan, right? no it's not going to be about makeup uh, and you're really in the, it, the, that's a very interesting pose there. <laughs> that's his uh, GQ pose for uh, right. yeah. Savinelli. Yeah, right. Savinelli. Uh, <laughs> meet, meet We're Mark. trying to sex up the whole pipe deal. There you go. <laughs> meet Mark. He has rescued a German shepherd and he likes long walks on the beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his favorite pipe tobacco is. Speak easy. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the first half of the show. A great cigar. We're going to take a break, and in a few minutes, we're going to come back, spend a lot more time with Mark, and we're going to be uh, lighting up Savinelli's Jupiter. Hang in there. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Be back in a flash with the cash. Oh, yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back to Not Just Blown Smoke. We're here with Mark Mormar, and we are lighting up Savinelli's Jupiter. And from the tin here, it says Savinelli's Jupiter is a commanding blend of burly, 
dark-fired Kentucky and Virginia's, archetypically cased and pressed into flakes. That also has a goodly number of adjectives in it there. It does. <laughs> Some godly adjectives in but there. I didn't you, want to to, you want to tell us anything else about this stuff, Mark? Um, no, I think that says it all, doesn't it? Um, I suppose it does. If you say no. so. um, well, you know, I mean, just so for any of the viewers who don't really know, uh, this is one of a um, trio of Savinelli's that we released a few months back all named after the Italian gods, Jupiter, Janus, and Juno. Mm -hmm. um, no rhyme or reason to which name went with which blend, uh, but paying you know some uh, respects to the Italian heritage of, uh, of Savinelli there. Um, no, I mean, it, so, you know, Jupiter is uh, essentially, um, even though we say that it's, um, it has described it as I think red and white Virginias with you know a, a touch of dark fire Kentucky and whatnot. But the truth is the really, the main base of this is actually white burley. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's more burley than is Virginias. It has a red Virginia, bright Virginia, uh, dark fire Kentucky. But then what makes it what distinguishes it I think um, from the other ones in the line and also. So I think distinguishes itself nicely when it just blends in general is then we've got molasses in there, rum in there, and um, and a little little taste of anisette. Really? Uh, um, and we actually use, I mean, I won't give you the brand, but think of a 130 proof rum that you know the name of very well. And that's what we use for this. Um, have next attention. Yes, you <laughs> Absolutely. You're going to have to give me the name after because I don't know any rums that are over 100 proof. Your crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, wait uh, a minute. This is, and, and uh, this is produced by Cornell and Deal for 7LA, correct? Correct. It's yeah. produced uh, at Cornell and Deal. It's a blend that we came up with on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and then they signed off on. And, um, you know, for me, I mean, I, I'm, I, I've smoked, I think, one tin of it. Um, I, I really like, I think it's got some nice layering to it. Yeah, um, yeah, I do too. Which, it's a very nice yeah, much for me. Background. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Paul, uh, what are we drinking with this? Something new. Something new? Something new. What, what is this? Glenfiddich 14. Oh, woo! <laughs> My oh. glass has magically refilled itself. Really? Fantastic. Mm. Good scotch. Mm. Good scotch. Good pick. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting, you know, how we are using the same thing to pair with two different things. Um, and Paul and I talked for a little bit, you know, right after he talked to Kendra about uh, what to do. And I thought the uh, Glenfiddich 14 uh, would pair well with the um, uh, Jupiter as well. But again, you know, this was a blind pairing in the sense that we didn't smoke it together and then make the decision. So this will be interesting. We'll see how this uh, how this goes as we smoke it along here. Um, what are our initial thoughts on on this? And then then we'll get into some. Uh, uh, discussion time with Mark about what's been going on with him, uh, Paul. So, right off the right off the bat, I'm getting a lot of earthy wood notes from the tobacco. Uh, I'm not picking up anything uh, Virginia related, no dried fruit or anything. It's just a lot of earthy wood, maybe a little bit of leather. Mm. Um, so it's I'm going to say it's more like a maybe medium full uh, mm -hmm. tobacco. Um, really, really. Uh, Really smooth, the the uh, retro hail, nice light spice. It's not overpowering at all. Mm. Really, really pleasant. Um, I'm liking this. Really am. Dave, uh, what are you picking up there? Um, I'm actually getting some of the Virginia notes, maybe like some bread, some wood, um, and uh, maybe a little bit of like you know a little raisin. Um, I think the uh, I think the the drink is definitely 
I'm bringing out um, more of the wood in the cigar to me. Um, it's a pipe, Dave. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, he's I'm cut looking. off. Yep. Okay. No more for Dave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Nick, first thoughts? Smooth, medium body, right up front. For me, I do get the, the sweetness in the Virginias. I definitely get what Paul was saying about the Retro Hill. You get a nice little light spice, smooth, earth, woody. And that's pretty much it right now. Mm. With the drink, the drink is kind of hiding a little bit of the sweetness up front, bringing out a little bit more earthy and woody notes in there on the back end mm -hmm. for the time being. Okay. I, I concur with a lot of what's been said. Um, I can pick up, I think, some of the sweet, uh, 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 sweetness that I attribute, you know, to the molasses that's in here. I get that kind of molasses, kind of dark sweetness um, but earthy, like a dark chocolate, almost dark, unsweetened chocolate, um, wood, earth. I get all those flavors. Does this all sound like we're talking, we're picking up what, uh, Jupiter's laying down or are we off the mark? No, I think you guys are, are well on. I mean, look, everybody's going to find a little something, especially when you're pairing it with, uh, uh, you know, a nice layered, uh, scotch as well it's going to pull out different th things for some it's going to uh enhance you know little bits of flavor and maybe pull out some of the sweetness um from the molasses and for others um it's going to instead get a little smokiness you know the slight smokiness of the dark yeah. fire right um so that's sort of one of the nice things i think about pipe tobaccos is that while we can probably all agree on you know the basic character of it we're all you know we we can pick up other things based on how our taste buds react to things like perique or kentucky or latakia you know so um you know just digging into things here how have things been for you down there in uh sunny south carolina since you've been with us like two or three weeks ago or whenever the last time was we the like um, popular you know, Depending, I'm so I'm sort of right on the border almost between South Carolina and North Carolina, and it's a different experience because in North Carolina you're required to wear a mask in public everywhere you go. Really? Yeah. And in South Carolina, it's um, really left up to store. So the supermarkets, you know, a lot of the stores now are requiring it when you come in. Right. But the large stores, but other places like cigar lounges, nobody's wearing a mask. But you go, you know, I go five miles and different direction <laughs> and I have to carry the mask in my pocket all the time. Uh, yeah. I mean, look, we're having, uh, we're having a heat wave like you guys were, we're having, uh, um, you know, all this COVID nonsense. Yeah. Uh, like you guys are overall things are good though. I think, I think pipe business is, has done very well. Um, uh, during this time, you know, it depends on obviously on the retailer, um, I know. I know. In fact, when you were talking in the earlier segment about the, uh, the humidor and what goes on there, I know a lot of retailers now that even though they can let people into the humidor, they're just not. Yeah. I really, you know, the size of yours and the number of people that come through would, you know, I'm sure it's much more prohibitive to try and you know do it one on one all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, the, the pipe business is doing well. That's awesome. I know. In in the Londonderry location of Twins, you, you kind of have to go into the walk-in. That's that's where you get the cigars. And so um, you kind of have to be mindful of that, and we can help people get their cigars when we're there. One of the things that's made it a little bit easier at our Hooksit location is it's a more traditional cabinet, you know, uh, arrangement. So all the cigars are behind glass. Right. So there's not so much touching and feeling that goes on here because everything's behind the glass. Um, but yeah, I can totally see that how um, cigar shops are a little bit uh, finicky about who they let in there you know, for all the reasons we talked about. 
Are, are you now? You're saying you've seen some uptick in in pipe business over the summer with uh, with shops that are carrying things. I, so, you know, my my personal experience this year, and I think actually I think part of this is true throughout. You know, with all our reps in three territories, um, is that you know overall on the retailer side we're we're a little flat. Okay. But we have a handful of, but that's sort of, that's part of a few things like Massachusetts not doing flavored tobaccos anymore, you know, like, um, and I was going to actually mention this to you guys and see if you were going to do, you should do a show on Matt Sherman closing down, I think. Um, I don't yeah, know. I talked, talked a little bit about that last week, but yeah, that's but, a, you know, that for, so that hurt me a lot because actually, so Sherman's is one of, was one of my major accounts oh wow uh, so while we're losing some on on one side uh, and a few mom and pops there are some shops that are doing triple the business that they were doing last june and july mm. so it's sort of evening itself out the ones that are suffering are for surely suffering but the ones that are doing well are doing really well um so if we can only bring the you know some of the lower ones up to speed we'll be you know we'll be in great shape um I think, you know, people don't know what to do. They don't know what to spend, you know, money on. There's certainly, I think, some of the smaller retailers who are seeing people buying boxes of cigars mm -hmm. need to make sure that they have those boxes in stock, which sort of eats into their budgets. You know, they can't afford to not sell a couple of boxes of cigars if a guy comes in. So they have to keep that stocked always. Whereas before, maybe, you know, they'd sell two boxes a week of something because they were selling individual sticks now that that same line they're selling you know 12 or 15 boxes a week so that eats a lot of the budget which hurts the pipe side right right um that leads to a real you know interesting question you know because i think you know uh the pipe side of things is something that a lot of cigar uh, a lot of smoke shops, excuse me, you know, tend to put on the back burner. You know, twins decided to put it on the front burner of things. And one of the reasons for that I think we've been so successful is so many other shops decided not to do it. Yeah. You know, and you know, and we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of good business come from having a, a healthy selection of pipes and tobaccos in the store. Um, you know, what kind of, what kind of, uh, um, advice would you give to shops out there that are maybe, you know, neglecting this and, you know, missing out on, on some, some money? I'll tell you exactly what I tell the accounts that are, that are like that. Um, and usually it's, it's ones who either, um, don't pay the pipe side any attention. It's a complete afterthought. Mm -hmm. um, or they don't just, they just don't have a pipe guy. The owner maybe never smoked a pipe. Um, right. So they don't have a pipe guy. And so it's not entirely their fault other than they're still leaving money on the table. Hire a guy who can smoke a pipe or put mm -hmm. one in somebody's hands and make, make him your pipe smoker. Um, yeah, I mean, what I tell them is, straight out is, is that they're leaving money on the table and that if you want to be a pipe shop, then you have to have pipes and you have to have tobaccos because a pipe smoker is going to walk in. And if all you have are six pipes, no matter what kind they are, you know, whether they're basket pipes or really not, you know, or nice Savinelli's, it won't matter. They won't see it as a pipe shop and they'll just find the, the pipe shop that's anywhere around. Right. Unless, you know, just have no choice whatsoever. And in those instances, I've said, you know, either do pipes or don't. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want, I will help you. I will show you the marketing. I'll, I'll come out with a plan with you. I'll spend time with you. I'll even train your staff if you want. I'll spend a full day with your staff. Um, and we can talk about it and get them up to speed. Um, but they have to want to put in that effort. Or give me back all, your, all the pipes that are mine and just blow out your others and don't bother with pipes. Maybe yeah. Not. If you're not going to think about it, don't be a pipe shop. Just be a cigar shop, which, of course, they don't want to hear because you're, I'm basically challenging them mm -hmm. to say, listen, 
you're if you're a tobacconist, then you have to pay attention to the pipe guys. Number one, it's a natural extension that is continuing to grow slowly. There's no boom like with cigars, but it's growing again. Mm-hmm. And um, and two, pipe guys will spend money. Yeah, you know they won't buy as many pipes as somebody buys boxes of cigars, but still, if you have a customer who can afford to buy, you know, 150 or $200 pipes, he's going to buy them with regularity. And he's going to be trying a bunch of different tobaccos too. And every time he comes through that door, your cash register will ring, including maybe his deciding to switch from wherever he's been getting cigars. Now that he thinks of you as a pipe shop, he's going to be coming there and buying the cigars with you rather than where he was before. Right. Um, so it's just a question of looking at the opportunities and then and then you know seizing them in one way or another. And we're happy to help any way that we can. I mean, I I like the idea of helping to build you know a pipe business. Now you know from my perspective, we got very lucky with you mm-hmm. because you're a pipe smoker. You get it. You're very smart. You have people, other people there on the staff who are also pipe smokers. Yep. And I didn't have to walk you through all of those steps, like, you know, a first timer, so to speak. But, you know, the growth that you've seen and that I've seen with you in the last year and a half mm-hmm. in spectacular from my side. Now, I get it. It's still a small percentage of the cigar side and in your case, the lounge side and the bar and everything else. Right. So you could probably afford not to do pipes if you if you want to, but you'd probably lose more than just that percentage. There would be some guys who then didn't come into the shop at all who are buying other things or going up to the bar. I agree. Uh, so there would be trickle down effects. And you know, we've had, you know, you know, kind of to what you're saying. You know, when when pipe people uh, come into a shop that has a very decent selection of stuff and is keeping up on things. Uh, pipe wise, accessory wise, tobacco wise, um, they tend to keep coming back. And, right. you know, places where, the, you know, you know, there's lots of online places where people can go to get pipes and tobaccos and stuff. And, and, um, but there's, there's a big part of that, especially when you're shopping for a pipe, to see it and touch it and hold it uh, is a, is 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 something that you really really want, and when you can produce that on a regular basis, you know we found that 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 uh, you know customers really tend to keep coming back to us because of our selection of of pipes and and tobaccos, and you know they may have been cigar smokers before, and now they're spending more money on you know, pipes and tobacco. And then in our case, because we have the bar, doesn't matter what they're smoking, they're going upstairs, you know, to the 724 lounge and getting a, and getting a drink too. Right. So, you know, and for me, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people uh, in my experience who, you know, enjoy pipes, you know, really like just enjoy the experience of smoking tobacco, whether it's cigars or pipes. And it's a, you know, pipe smoking, you know, I've said this before, is just a whole different world of tastes and flavors um, that cigars just don't offer because the tobacco is from different regions. It's processed differently. Um, you get to deal with it differently. It's a whole other experience. And to me, it's not like cigars or pipes. It's kind of like you want bourbon or do you want wine? Yeah. Do you want, you know, a, a red or do you want a white? It's, you know, what are you in the mood for now? And, you know, I think offering that is a big is a big plus. I mean, I, I think <clears throat> and and uh, uh, Paul, you know, was not a pipe smoker at all before um, we started this podcast. <laughs> and I know he really enjoys it. What do you think about Paul, about how the build up of the the pipe uh, station at Twins has helped uh, you appreciate tobacco. How's it? How's your perception of it as far as it's helped Twins as a as a retailer? So with with me, it's it's it was just getting into it and realizing the different flavors that you were getting out of the pipe and the tobacco. 
Um, and when any, any, whenever a customer would come in and they would see the uh, wide variety of tobaccos that we offer and the pipes that we offer, when customers come into our, our retail center, a lot of them just kind of turn around to see what's what's available in the uh, in the in the general accessory area, and then they see the pipe section, and they walk down there, and they'll look around, and they'll kind of, you know, g- you know, gaze, and they'll come into the humidor, and they'll and a lot of them will come and say, you know, I've been thinking about starting pipe smoking, mm. and then we get into a discussion with them, and we talk about. I, I personally will tell them, listen, I didn't start smoking a pipe until a year ago, and I was always a cigar, a cigar smoker, and once I got into pipes. The flavors that you're getting out of them are going to be a little different than what you get out of a cigar. You're going to start, you know, I told them about the Virginias and the mm. Burleys and the Kentuckys and the Periques and the different blends and all that. And they start to peak an interest. And next thing you know, they're buying, maybe they'll buy a corn cob to start off. And then they're going to buy a, a basket pipe. Then they'll go to a Savinelli or a Peterson. Mm. Um, so it, 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 it peaks their interest. And I said, listen, I wasn't a, I was not a pipe smoker at all. Now I appreciate it a lot more. I don't smoke as much as Dan does, or as Dave does, or as Nick does, but I really appreciate what it offers me, what it gives me, uh, the, the 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 different direction in terms of flavors too. It just complements uh, the cigar smoking experience. It really does. So I just say it's not you're not going to get the same flavors, right. but you're going to get different flavors. It's a different experience. Uh, once you get the hang of it, it just it just becomes more of a natural process. It really, really is exciting. Hmm. Yeah, that's now, an interesting point that Paul brings up because I think a large majority of smokers, particularly cigar smokers, have thought about a pipe. Oh, that kind of looks cool, or maybe I'll try it sometime. And but they don't usually act on it, or they walk into another cigar store that maybe has just a handful of pipes, or might have. A wide variety of, of pipes, but nobody there who can talk to them about pipes. Mm-hmm. Where they say, you know, hey, I've been thinking about getting a pipe. Well, if you're if you're enjoying it yourself, and you can educate them and say, oh yeah, really, that's cool. Why haven't you? And they give you an answer. Now it becomes a conversation, and you're able to say, you know, things like, you know, you're going to have a vast uh, offering of different blends on the pipe side that you'll never have. Uh, on the cigar side. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of little things that begin to then pique their interest. And then they see a pipe in the corner of their eye that, that they like, and all of a sudden they're buying it. And now they're on the hook for, you know, at least one tin or two or three of tobaccos. Um, and, uh, and you've got a cot, you've got them at that point. Yep. You know, if you can't even, if you have the pipes, I mean, that's the other problem too. You can have money and put up a pipe wall, but if you don't talk to them, if it's, you know, if it's put away behind glass where nobody pays attention to it and you don't have anybody who smokes, who's going to bring a smoker over to it and talk to them about what pipe smoking might mean to try if they're a first timer, um, then you still won't get that person to convert. Um, so I think all those little pieces have to kind of come together. Um, and that's, that's, you know, the vast, um, advantage of the retail shops, um, in the pipe world is that they can really make a difference. And so either be a pipe shop or don't be a pipe shop. We've had customers that have come in that are, are, I'll call them seasoned cigar smokers. And several occasions we've had them come in where they were all set to go into the humidor to buy their cigars and they... They've been talking about pipes and tobacco, but never acted upon it. Then one night they come in and they like, this is it. I'm going to go down to the pipe department and I'm going to get myself a pipe and tobacco and I'm going to start this. And it's, it's really, it's great to see that because they've been thinking about it for a while and then it just, it, it has to be the right time for them, but it, it happens. And then they, they, they act upon it and now it's, it's a part of them. So right. they just have to make that that step, that move into that world, and then once you once they once they get into it and really realize what the the pipe and tobacco brings to them, they're hooked. Yeah, yeah. How important is it, in in putting something together like that to have some kind of, you know, not only to have obviously if you don't have somebody on your staff at a at a shop who can talk about pipes at a reasonable level of, of 
confidence, it's, it's never going to work, right? But then, you know, one of the things that I think uh, uh, that is important for building up that community is to do a uh, pipe club or something where you're either hosting one or allowing a local pipe club to meet at your shop. How important is that to building the process? To having, a, to having some sort of pipe smokers around, whether it's staff or a club, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. I think it's essential. I think if you have, if you, if you're able to host the pipe club, um, then you know that the pipe smokers are comfortable in your space there, and they'll keep coming back. Um, and invariably, you know, if you see a group of it doesn't even matter, even if it's only five or six guys and gals sitting around a table or two and smoking a pipe, like all in a cluster. How could you not walk in and be like, oh, what's going on here? Pipe club. Oh, cool. When do they, you know, how often do they meet? What's that all about? And then maybe they end up having the conversation we were just talking about now happens with another customer, um, which has its own big advantage because then there's no pressure either, right? They're getting it straight from the horse's mouth of why they're a cigar smoker, but are also enjoying pipes. Um, so I, I think it. I think it means a lot. I find, you know, in in truth, to really grow, you have to have somebody, um, at least one person, preferably more than that, who are pipe smokers. But you can start for those retailers who don't have a pipe. Smoker. I'll give you. I'll give you a good example. Um, the Sixth Avenue Davidoff store in Manhattan. Um, didn't have a pipe smoker on staff. Mm. Um, and they sell a lot. Of, they have a ton of really high-end pipes, and, you know, including also Savinelli's and Peterson's, but they have a ton of Dunhills. And, um, there are people there who are just going to going to shop. You know, that's the kind of store where you can sell, like, solid gold DuPonts all day. But they didn't have a pipe person, and the pipes were not moving, or even the tobaccos, as well as they should. And I went in, and I spent a day with the staffs there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we talked, you know, just from the beginnings, I basically made it like pipe smoking 101. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, listen, even if, and I, the Davidoff bought each of them a Rossi pipe mm -hmm. um, so that they could experience it. Um, I gave them some tobaccos to try. And I said, listen, if nothing else, even if you don't smoke, you have to have a knowledge of this. So here's where we start. And we went over to their displays. So the, the pipes are a little bit self-explanatory. You're Let right. me tell you about briars and why some prices are different than others, but that's you know that's a, a merchandising conversation, really. Right. You know? um, but I'll take them you know to over to where the tobaccos are, and I'll say, listen, you've got a bunch of different tobaccos here. If somebody walks in, there's no way they can give them some advice. So let's change the display a little bit. So here on the left side, I'm going to stack all of your aromatics, and then next to that I'm going to put together all of your English blends and next to that all of your you know Virginias so at least if somebody comes in the staff now has an idea of oh you like what you want a Virginia sir yes here's what we have in the selection and hopefully somebody on the staff will start smoking and will start trying them themselves so it could be a little more specific than that but if it's if you have a good staff who wants to be better at their job Mm -hmm. then hopefully they're going to then take the initiative from there anyway. I've given them a little bit of a base of what I can and mm -hmm. said, okay, now take it from here. And, um, you know, whatever little knowledge you have, try and make it grow. And it will by osmosis, if you start to have conversation, don't be afraid to say, I haven't tried this yet. Right. To a customer. What did you think? Because they'll also give you advice too. Well, I, you know, I like this and I really like that a lot. Well, now you, that's something that you can tuck in your back pocket from a smoker who comes in. The next one who comes in and says, well, I like this tobacco. Now you can say, well, hey, then you might want to try this too. I know some guys who come in here and they like them both. Mm. Um, so I, you, can, you can start to build that, that pipe section in a responsible way. Uh, even from even from a non-pipe store, mm. a tobacconist. But you, but then you have to be a proper tobacconist too, in some way, shape, or form. Right. All right. Let's pull the conversation back a little bit. You know, to to what we're smoking here and kind of getting a, you know, uh, you know, you brought up you know the importance of 
having your tobaccos kind of arranged, you know, so that people can at least know, you know, here's the Virginias, here's the aromatics, here's the English. Um, as we're smoking this, you know, Burley blend, what makes this Burley blend really kind of stand out from other Burleys that are available to the consumer? Well, I think partially it's a Burley blend without being heavy handedly a Burley blend, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's the, it's the, um, highest percentage of the tobacco and mm -hmm. at the base. But when you start to add, you know, what you've done is to sort of remove that burly aspect, not remove the burly aspect, but to make it more complex. Right. In red Virginia, you know, bright Virginia, uh, a little bit of dark burly to go with that white burly, a little bit of uh, dark fire at Kentucky. Um, so forgetting about then the, the, the molasses and the rum and the anisette that's added to it, you already have an interesting match for a burly, I think. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times you'll find burlies too that are either like really heavy-handed burly or they're burly and now you're throwing in Latakia or Perique, which is gonna change that flavor entirely. Yes. There's nothing in this that is that is taking away from or either enhancing the burly or contrasting it in a way that is going to take away from from the burly. You can you can you might not have that like Paul was saying, he might not be getting the Virginia sweetness. I don't know whether or not he's starting to get some some sweetness from like the molasses in the rum. Um, but you already have a complex essentially a burly blend and then you add the other ingredients to it and I I think I'd be hard-pressed to think of what else is out there that, that you know is sort of a navy flake burly mm. you know it's true uh, you know that's one of the reasons I asked I it, it's a very unique kind of blend and a very unique presentation and um, uh, definitely you know the what I taste more than anything else in this is the burley but those other tobaccos really add a lot of complexity to it um, and a lot of uh, uh, you know subtle notes that kind of really enhance that experience of, of the burly there. Now, as you know, you've, you've already talked a little bit about how, uh, North Carolina is still very, you know, masks everywhere. And there may be a lot of restrictions on things, South Carolina, not so much. Uh, are you starting to see, um, uh, are you doing more traveling? Are you doing more shows these days or is it still I kind of, Working from home or what? I haven't, I haven't been doing any shows. Mm -hmm. um, people, a lot of the places are, well, I did one, a, a relatively small one. Mm -hmm. um, people are a little bit nervous about either, you know, how people are going to congregate. And um, is it going to either scare people away or are they going to have so many people that it's going to, to attract some attention from, you know, um, the local community that's just going to end up by being a complaint. So... The events right now, people are being very cautious about. Um, you know, same sort of reason that you, you know, aren't going to be doing, you know, uh, what was going to be an upcoming event. Yeah, our, our big annual barbecue. Right. Which is a real shame. And, and, and you know, the the big reason for that is, you know, for for groups of a hundred or more people, uh, the state is requiring everybody to wear masks at all times. And so that really just made having our big barbecue, which is usually around 200 people, just just not possible. It just wasn't the smart thing to do with those restrictions in place. So uh, I think we're going to be doing some other things um, on a smaller scale to kind of uh, take its place this year. But yeah, um, that's that's it's it's too bad. But I I. I get where people are at and uh, um, see why it's important to be cautious, especially when you have that many people together. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I, so I am 
traveling a little bit more. I'm not. I'm still not really flying at the moment. They sort of um, discouraged it, and honestly, flying's not a lot of fun to begin with, right? Uh, anymore, and you get the idea of you know how many how many more restrictions you're going to have wearing the mask and whatnot. So I've got some little bit longer driving, but I'm still also mostly in like the the rest of this week I'll be in uh, Eastern Tennessee. And then next week I'll be in part of Kentucky. And then the following week I'll go to Ohio, all places that I can, you know, drive um, and then make, you know, some sort of a loop over a shortened period of time as opposed to jumping on a plane. And like, I'm not, not going to Florida. I'm not going to New York at the moment. Um, but I want to, I want to then extend it. We'll see. We'll see what happens with, you know, all of this nonsense, but um, I'm hoping then by, you know, middle of next month, I'll be making a trip back up to Northeast anyway. That would so, be awesome. You know, it, yeah. Yeah. Time to see you guys, you know, then anyway, because I was, that's about when I was going to do it. Right. Right. Um, one of the things that uh, we talked about, I think the last time you were on the show was that uh, uh, Cornell and Deal was working on a uh, um, brick and mortar uh, yeah. only you know, uh, blend. I yeah. haven't heard anything much about that lately. Is that still in the works? What's, what's it, going it on? It's still in the works. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we have the blend now. Okay. Um, and, but before we release that, we'll be coming out next month with golden days of yore, which is the, uh, Christmas blend. Ooh. Now, what's the deal with that? I saw, I saw that come across in my emails and mm -hmm. they said it was, a. uh, I think they said it was an aromatic in in that in that email. But what I saw the ingredients, you know, the Virginias, the uh, there's Virginia in it, Cavendish. I can't remember anything else. What what can you tell us about that blend? Um, you know, I haven't. When that notice went out, it, they it, it was more information than I had really had up until that point because I wasn't sure that the the blend had been decided on. We had tried several different ones. And, and I didn't know that they had actually picked one and were going to run with that that particular blend. So I don't have a lot of experience with it yet myself. Um, but I'm hoping I'll smoke some of it soon because I'm going to have to write a marketing uh, announcement for it. Um, but that will that will be out shortly, and then after that, the next tobacco release will be the uh, should be the brick and mortar, and then we'll do another Carolina Red Flake. Now. Is the the releasing the Carolina Red Flake? Is that was that something that was always in the works, or was that in you know a response? And I have no idea whether there's been a response, but did people miss just the straight Carolina Red Flake? And and you guys said, well, we better we better come out with one of those. No, we um, we I haven't actually I haven't heard that. Although that's the way I personally feel about it. I like the Carolina Red Flake just the way <laughs> it was. Although I like, yeah. you know, the Preak made it sort of interesting too, but, you know, I prefer it straight. Mm. Um, um, you know, there was always a plan to try and fit that into another run, provided that we had the tobacco and um, and it would fit in with the scheduling for what else we wanted to do for the year. I think I think the only question was going to be, as the year started, was do we do a brick and mortar exclusive and the Carolina red flag, you know, we usually have just X number of releases a year. So do we add another one into the mix or do we replace one with the other? Sure. And the feeling was, you know, there was no reason to just replace it because um, we want to do something special for the brick and mortars. At the same time, we have a whole customer base that loves that Carolina red flag. So, you know, let's right. get it out if we can. All right. Well, let's do let's do let's take the time to do some uh, listener questions. And uh, I have a couple here that were sent to me. And one was for Lauren, who is, of course, not here. And um, the question for her was, uh, is the San Cristobal uh, San Cristobal, excuse me, revelation the same blend as the Ashton VSG? but with lower primings. They had read that somewhere on the internet mm, that it question. was the same thing with lower priming. So it was kind of a 
uh, milder version of the uh, VSG. And um, uh, I have talked with Lauren about that. And the answer is uh, yes and no. The wrapper on the uh, San Cristobal revelation is from the same plant that uh, the VSG gets its uh, wrapper from, and it is from a lower priming. Uh, but the uh, binder and filler of the San Cristobal are Nicaraguan, where the VSG is all Dominican. So, no, they're not the same cigar, but the wrapper is from the same plant, and it's a little bit of a milder leaf because it's uh, from a lower uh, priming of the plant. So there's the answer to that question there. And then there was one for you, Mark. Ooh. And uh, the question is this, other than the cool naming convention, like, you know, the uh, uh, Juno, Jupiter, Janus, um, how is uh, a line of pipe tobacco connected? Is there a common tobacco in all of them? And then they're blended with different tobaccos. You know, and so I think of like... Um, um, uh, the um, Billy Bud, for instance, mm -hmm. you've got Billy Bud, you've got Billy Bud Blue, you've got Billy Bud Blonde. Is right. there a common tobacco blend? A uh, common tobacco in all of those things? And then, yeah. the you know, how does how does the naming come up with the series? Um, so the simple answer is no. They don't connect to one another in terms of a base that then gets tweaked one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, they're all very different. I mean, the, the, the Jupiter, we've already, we've already talked about, um, the components, the, the Janus is, um, it's bright Virginia and Orientals from Turkey and Greece. Um, so a completely different flavor profile. And then the Juno is, is just, it's stoved red Virginia uh, with bright Virginia. And then that gets stoved again with some fresh red Virginia thrown on top of that um, and nothing else. So you've got a really straight Virginia there. So you have three very different profiles. Um, and the intention was to come out with um, three tobaccos that are named after the Greek gods and that excel on their own because of their differences, not because of their similarities. Mm. Okay. Well, and, they... you know, you know uh, Jupiter and, and Juno were married, and we know that married couples are always entirely different anyway. <laughs> that is a true thing. That is just true. staying faithful to the, the human condition, you know? If, uh, if, you, if you like Dark Fire Kentucky, it's for sure she's going to want straight Virginia. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is so true. Very true. <laughs> so true. All right, uh, let's switch gears here a little bit, and we'll, we're going to go to News with Paul. Okay. Court delays FDA product approval requirements for premium cigars indefinitely. Indefinitely? Indefinitely. indefinitely. That means forever, right? Not quite. <laughs> but... <laughs> The FDA's ability to require premium cigar companies to seek product approval for its cigars has been delayed indefinitely by a federal court. Judge Amit Mehta of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia has ruled in the cigar industry's favor in an ongoing lawsuit against the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. He has granted the cigar industry's request for relief and delayed FDA's ability to enforce its pre-market approval process for premium cigars until after the agency completes a thorough review and considers a streamlined process specifically for premium cigars. As such, premium, premium cigar companies will not have to file for product approval on the September 9th, 2020 deadline. The ruling will apply to almost all cigars found in humidors across the country, with a notable exception of flavored and infused cigars, which are not considered premium by the FDA. Meta's ruling does not require FDA to enact a streamlined substantial equivalence process for premium cigars, only that the agency must study the issue 
and cannot require premium cigars to go through the substantial equivalence or another process until after that study is complete. Given the nature of the FDA, it is likely, though not guaranteed, mm. that this process will take multiple years. Multiple mm. years. <clears throat> so it's a reprieve and a delay that might take at least two or three years minimum. At least. Just to see a resolution. Now, <clears throat> did this dynamic equivalence uh, for cigars, did it also apply to pipe tobaccos, Mark? Do you know? Um, not exactly, but yes. We, we also have got to go through, the, the threat has been that any sort of blending of tobaccos, mm -hmm. of premium tobaccos that are essentially hand-blended, whether they're rolled um, or blended in tin, would have to go through sort of similar to what the uh, the spirits industry has, where if you bring a new product in, into the market, um, it has to go through the Food and Drug Administration to be tested, quote, tested, and determine whether or not um, uh, one does it fit into a particular category. Like with spirits, you have to, if you're bringing in a vodka, it has to fit into the definition of what a vodka is according to the Food and Drug Administration. So the idea is that with the tobaccos, any sort of blending, they would have to put their stamp of approval on. So yes, it applies, but it's a slightly different statute, I believe. Right. So is this, does this, you know, this is obviously written, you know, for the cigar industry. Does that give some relief to uh, you as well? I, I believe it does. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk to Jeremy about it, but um, I know that we've been for the last couple of years sort of on hold, hold waiting to hear what these rulings were going to be before we could start doing new blending also. Right. Uh, so uh, my understanding of it is that, that um, yes, it gives us a little more um, ability to do some new sorts of blending that we might not have done before, even while we were just ra waiting for uh, for review and a, and a decision, you know, I'm glad we already know it's going to be a couple, a few years because you know if they said, well, it's just six months, then I think everybody still holds off. They don't want to spend money and then not be able to bring it to market. I think one of the one of the uh, you know again you know this you know again to Nick's point, it's it's not a forever thing. It's a it's a put off until you do this thing. Right. And, you know, the big question is, is the FDA going to do it? And how long are they going to take to do it? Yeah. They've already said that the premium cigars are at the bottom of their priority list of things to do, which to me means, you know, they're not thinking about starting this process, you know, next week, you know, or even next month. So, you know, and putting together a streamlined process of dynamic equivalence. Um, I know that the, the paperwork that was already, um, you know, kind of released and in place was something on the, the lines of 40 pages of material for every SKU. Right. Um, which is ridiculous. And, you know, you think of a company like Cornell and Deal, if you had to do that with your pipe tobaccos, you have 400 active SKUs. Oh, yeah. You know, it would be have somebody, mass somebody. massively expensive and time-consuming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what they want, right? I mean, in the end, the whole idea is to really sort of shut us all down, right? To make it so regulated that we can't do our business. Um, right. And now, listen, you know, bear in mind, that delay that they're estimating right now, if you take a few years, did things go sideways in November... That could change. Yeah. You know, there could become an edict all of a sudden to, you know, let's get our S's back on tobacco. And mm -hmm. uh, and it could really be fast tracked. So that's where it becomes problematic. You start to put money into something that is going to take, you know, a few months to develop. And then a few months from now, they come up with a different ruling. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So everyone's you know, still, still on pins and needles a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, definitely a win, but, uh, 
maybe still, the only attempt still, at one. still doesn't really change anything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, how about we do a would you or other question? Oh, no, okay. That? Here's my would you rather question. And Mark, we'll start with you because you're our special guest. Special, special guest. Who did you? Yeah. Are you saying that Lauren bailed on us? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, <laughs> if she, dumb, she, dumb, she, dumb. you know, her problem was that, you know, she lost her voice, you know, so, you know, you know, can I really blame her? No, but I'm no. still going to poke fun. We could have had gonna like poke a, a little fun. Could have had like a sign language person come in and do sign language. Well, it would have been something. really cute. Like this, this Ashton. Let me tell you about it. It's really, <laughs> it's really as long as she has her voice by Friday. Yes. Yeah. As long as she has it by Friday. Um, would you rather, Mark? Yes. Be an infamous villain. Ooh. Or an unknown superhero. An infamous villain or an unknown superhero. Well, does that mean that I'm just a superhero that doesn't do anything? Or do I get to, like, save lives and do all kinds of cool shit and I can fly and stuff anyway? But nobody but knows, nobody my knows, knows nobody who you are. Secretly. Nobody knows who you are. You get no credit for anything you do. Yeah, I'd rather be an unknown superhero. I'd rather have those powers and do some good and, you know... I don't care whether people know me or not, but a villain, you know, I don't know. Some of the villains are pretty cool, though. I got to say, they get some pretty cool costumes. If you're, mm. And you can kind of, you know, you can have a lot more fun as a villain. It's true. It's true. So it's from good. a moral standpoint, I would like to say I would rather be unknown and do good. But there is definitely a piece of me that's like, you know what? Maybe I'd rather just be a fucking bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Dave, infamous villain or unknown superhero? <laughs> He's going to be a villain. <laughs> no, I'd totally go for the superhero. No, you would. I would. No, unknown would. superhero. Unknown superhero. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because mm -hmm. with, with every choice, there's always a price. And man, the villains, they always get it in the end. So Do they? I would I'd much, much rather be in the, uh, the unknown superhero. I don't know. The Joker has been, uh, been around for a long time. He's gotten killed a bunch of times, too. <laughs> <laughs> Nick? Ooh. Infamous villain or unknown That's superhero? A hard, that's a hard choice, I suppose. Who are you again? <laughs> It'd be probably be the unknown hero. It would have to be the unknown hero. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, pretty sure. Because I've, I've been, you know, for me growing up, uh, having my, almost my entire family in police, in the police world. Mm -hmm. And that for me was my heroes growing up. And back in the day, it was kind of like that unknown hero type of thing. So for me, that would be it. I wouldn't mind going out, saving lives, fighting fires or fighting crime and being an unknown to me i know that i'm doing good i'm doing i'm saving a life or you know fighting crime and making sure that person goes to jail even if i don't get recognition for it i don't care that's not my thing i'd love to just go out there and do good knowing that i'm doing good for paul or dave or you or mark or lauren to sit at home safely that for me is. You know. Remember, you're you're an unknown superhero. Lauren would never know. I don't care. Yeah, Lauren would never. Know. I don't care as long as she you. as long as she can sit at home. You might want pooch. Lauren to know about you. That's she, okay, she man. Know. She knows me as Nick, the guy that sells cigars at Twin Smoke Shop. Yep. I'm very happy with that. Mm -hmm. and I don't care as long as I know that everybody else is safe. Everybody they don't have to know me. About being Lauren's superhero. <laughs> Paul? Paul. One of my favorite lines in the movies was from the movie The Devil's Advocate. Mm -hmm. Ooh. When Al Pacino said to Keanu Reeves, never let him see you coming. And I've always been one that flies under the radar. 
I don't need to be the center of attention. I would rather just be the quietly confident person. Um, so I would absolutely be the, the, the unknown superhero. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like, looks like we're all unanimous about that. That'd certainly be my choice for much of the same reasons that, uh, Paul said, I'm more of an introvert, I think anyway. So, you know, um, there's a there's a certain satisfaction of being able to do something and have people not know who you are. Yeah, you know, um, I've been binge watching Person of Interest, which is pretty much that same thing. The unknown superhero, just the guy in the suit. Who is that guy? Nobody knows. You know, is it, um, is it God or an angel? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, I'm glad we all have decided to side on the side of good. <laughs> that, that, that gives some hope. Uh, except except for this, Mark. Mark's kind of... motley crew of guys here that are not just blowing smoke. <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. So what's our final verdict here on uh, Savinelli's Jupiter? Dave, do you want to give your final thoughts? Mm -mm -mm. It's, it's freaking fantastic, Dan. Freaking fantastic. Any particular why reason why it's freaking fantastic, Dave? Um, I've been I've been smoking Jupiter for a while, and I'm I'm a big Virginia fan. Uh, I love those the role that the Burley plays in this. Um, the woods, the, I get, I get a lot of Virginia notes from this. Um, I feel like the pairing has kind of brought out the Burley side, um, and. It's just I don't know. I'm all over it. It's really good. He's all He's over. All over it. It. He's all over it. He's all, He's over, all over the wood. <laughs> he loves his wood. <laughs> wow. Just can't get enough of that wood. Mm -hmm. um, Nick. Yes. What do you think of uh, Jupiter? It's fantastic. You like um, it? Medium body. In the beginning, I was getting a lot of the Virginias up front. Probably some of the Burleys in the back. Uh, as I was getting down halfway, three-quarters of the bowl, it switched on me. Mm. So the Burley started to come alive a little bit more, started to come up front, and then the Virginias for me were playing a little bit in the background. Uh, still really smooth, still really got that nice little spice on the retro hail, but it went really good with the Glen Fitted. It was amazing. Very, very, very well put together by Paul. Kudos, Paul. <clears throat> what do you think? And this is your first experience with uh, the great Roman god of Jupiter. Yes, it is. What uh, What do you think of this tobacco? I, I liked it very much. Um, like I said, uh, it, I could not pick up any of the Virginia notes, no dried fruit. It was pretty much all burly for me, um, which I still like very much, the, uh, the earthy wood notes. Um, it didn't change on me at all. Um, I think the pairing just brought out and enhanced more of that earthy wood tones. Uh, the, the retro hail has that nice light spice. Mm -hmm. uh, that did not change one bit. It's been very consistent. Um, I liked it very much. It's not my favorite tobacco, but I, I really, really think it's uh, it's something that I could smoke again. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it's probably like a medium, medium plus. Initially, mm -hmm. I thought it was medium full. It had a lot more body. It kind of settled down a little bit. Uh, but uh, it's it's a very, very good tobacco. Bless me. Bless, Bless you. you. Thank you. Thank you, boys. Did you just sneeze into your mic? I sneezed into the mic. Wow. I'm going to have to uh, hit it with bleach after this. Oh, my gosh. It's your mic now, after man. That, it's my uh, mic. I'm not yep. touching that mic. Mm. Excellent. Uh, well, I agree with the, the comments that have gone around. You know, uh, medium, um, medium plus, uh, lots of earthy, nutty cocoa notes from the Burley. Uh, it's a... Definitely a Burley forward blend. And if you're a fan of Burley, you're going to love this. Um, I think the uh, addition of the um, uh, rum and the molasses really enhanced things as well and um, added a little background sweetness to this. Um, I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy Burley blends very much. So for me, this is very, very good. Um, Mark, what are you what are you looking at there? Uh, puppy who's just trying to steal my coffee. Uh, <laughs> you've trained your dog well in these four days that you've had this dog. Yeah, she likes to, she likes a little coffee with her pipe and cigar as well. So. Nice. <laughs>
All right, people. Well, next week, we're going to be <laughs> starting the show with La Aurora's Carl Malone, Sumo Toro. And then in the second half, we're going to be lighting up Briarworks International's Sweet Tea. Sweet Tea. Sweet Tea. And uh, we're going to find out about uh, those two things next week. <laughs> and um, Attorney Diaz from La Aurora Cigars will be with us. We're excited about that. That's going to be his first time on the show. Mark, this is like your 12th time being with us or something. Yeah, where's my jacket? <laughs> does he get a jacket? What kind of jacket does he get? He should get something. Mm. Good grief. He's he's. I think he's beaten <laughs> out uh, uh, Eric Wentworth as the most often guest on the show. Yeah. Yeah. We can get him a, a black uh, smoking jacket. Maybe yeah, we can smoking jacket with, you know, yeah. Each time, <laughs> each time another, like, have an old twin shirt he can have. We'll get you a not just blowing smoke sticker. Okay, great. <laughs> JBS. Mark, thanks for being with us tonight. We really thanks, enjoy Mark. having you on the show. It's always a pleasure to have you on. We're looking forward to seeing you in a little bit. Likewise. And Likewise. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. I was in a lot when I'm here with you. Mm. All right. That's our show for this week. Thanks for being with us, guys. And we'll see you next week when we're smoking the Carl Malone and Briarworks Sweet Tea. We'll see you next Monday, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock? Uh, <laughs> not just blowing smoke, folks. How are we going? You've another been listening day, to smoke, Not boys. Just Blowing Smoke, the podcast that brings the wealth of knowledge, expertise, and fun of Twins Smoke Shop, New England's premier smoke shop, right to you, wherever you are, whenever you want it. You can find us at our website, notjustblowingsmoke.com, and keep in touch with us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram at Not Just Blowing Smoke. Thanks for listening, everybody. And that is Not Just Blowing Smoke. Rolling with the top